Reactor online. Sensors online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Hello, everyone. Carrie here uh, with the Unicorn Company podcast. I know it's been a while, um, but things have been hectic in my life. And hectic is not great. Uh, we'll just put it that way. So, first of all, I want to go ahead and um, as far as news, I'm really not going to go into it because what I'm going to be talking about is news. And of course, also the. Uh, the main topic of this is news as well, as well as a little bit of um, dissecting something that, that came out recently. So first of all, uh, as far as news, um, oh, there were two things. Oh, yes. First, uh, I'm not going to be covering anything from Catalyst or anything. I'll worry about the next episode. Uh, but we have seven days left on the raffle to benefit the Trevor Project. Um, and there will be a link below, but you can also go to give.thetrevorproject.org slash fundraiser slash battle tech. That'll take you directly to the fundraiser. Um, every $5 you donate, we'll get you another entry. So your first five gets you one. If you donate 10, it's two, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, once you've done that, go ahead and um, forward a copy of the email receipt to trevorbtraffle at gmail.com. And that'll get you your entries in. And, you know, because when you do when you do make a, a donation on the site, it, it lets me know that someone made a donation. Um, if you do it anonymously, obviously it doesn't tell me who it is. If it's not anonymously... It automatically tells me the email is one so I can confirm if, you know, you did it anonymously. I can be like, oh, okay, that's who that is. And the other thing is um, it also, excuse me, it also gives me contact information to reach you if, um, you know, if you do win prizes, you'll be able to uh, get those prizes. Also, while well, contacting, get the information we need to get them to you. Also, the other thing that was brought to my attention recently is there is a set of rules for the Battletech Alpha Strike Championship Circuit, which is Catalyst Game Lab's official um, official tournament format for Alpha Strike, and uh, well. It's interesting. We'll just put it that way. So, first of all, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go over the rules, and then we're going to, I'm going to, I put together a theoretical force. Um, and I'm going to talk about how I, with one force, how I've broken the rules. Well, not broken them, but broken them, like, Playtesting broken. All right, so pretty much the document opens. It's the Battletech Alpha Strike version of the Championship Circuit 2023 season. Um, Battletech Championship Circuit, uh, BTCC, series of competitive level Battletech events, meaning that a firm grasp of rules of the game is required. It's not recommended for beginners. Um, and it goes on to explain the use of Swiss rounds. Uh, you have the player's responsibility responsibilities um you have to bring your own miniatures for force lists um and it's at least one copy for each round of the event and one for the judges for review record sheets dice pencils other writing utensils game aids rule books other materials useful for playing um and you should not expect that these are going to be provided for you or that the force sheets will be printed for you um miniatures pretty much only official miniatures are legal uh includes the catalyst game lab game labs plastic miniatures 
Ironwind Metals and Ralpartha. 3D printed models are not allowed. Um, what I do find interesting is that they don't mention the FASA plastics. So I'm assuming they are grandfathered in with the CGL, but we would that that would require some clarification most likely because some of the FASA plastics like the third edition box set aren't bad. The um, City Tech ones are a nightmare. All models have to be painted to a three color minimum, tabletop standard. Uh, have to be on a hex base that is 1.25 inches or 32 millimeters from flat to flat and is covered with basing material of some kind. Uh, the model used to represent a particular unit or chassis may, must be of the same chassis for the variant being used. So you can use an atlas to represent any of the atlases, um, a marauder to be any of the marauders, etc. So then they go into the force registry. Um, first of all, it's 400 points. 50% uh, of the unit by point value must be spent on max. Uh, you must have at least eight and no more than 15. Units must be selected from the same faction and era on the master unit list. So basically you lock your force into whatever faction and era you prefer. Uh, force registries are built using force building rules beginning on page 110 of Alpha Strike Commander's Edition. This is important and will come up later um, with the following changes. When building an Alpha Strike Force, players may pick units from their chosen faction and associated generals list only. Units should be assigned a formation, uh, allowing players to use the special pilot abilities provided by that formation. Um, and then it says, please note the section titled Companies, Binaries, and Beyond, as well as the charts on page 124, are not used. In order to begin the game with formation SPA bonuses, formation must begin the game at or above the prescribed unit strength for that formation. Uh, each force registry may use a maximum of three of any unit chassis, including variants. Um, for example, a force registry may include three locust battle mechs, each of which may be a different variant, or all three may be the same variant, but no more than three total locust chassis may be taken. So you are allowed to take three of the same variant of a chassis. That's also going to come up. Uh, infantry and battle armor are exempt from this limit. So you can just have all of the same battle armor, any unit. And Protomex must be fielded in points, not full stars. And types may be mixed. Uh, unit skill ratings are limited to the following. Force Registry may have up to one skill one, up to two skill twos, and may not have units of skill zero, six, or seven. Players must have multiple copies of their force registries, one for review by the GM uh, before the event begins, and one for each round of the event. Force registries used by each player in a round are turned into the head judge along with the round scorecard for record keeping purposes. Uh, organizer responsibilities. The GM will pr provide the gaming surface to be played upon, guidelines for each type of playing surface, uh, also determine pairings. Um, they also do have to check all the forces before the event, so it's recommended that you turn in forces beforehand. Mm, sorry, I'm a little tired. Um, gaming surfaces, so minimum, ta minimum table surface is 43 inch long by 35 inches wide and maximum of 48 square. Uh, pairings and concessions for the first round of the event, pairing will be determined random, randomly determined. Uh, this will be done by the agent via randomizer app or simply names in a hat or whatever they're going to use. Uh, for all subsequent rounds, players are based are paired based on total match score for the round. Uh, before, with the highest scores, playing the next highest, and so on. 
If there is a tie, determine who is currently ranked higher by strength of schedule and if any of the players have already met in previous rounds. Players should not play against the same opponent more than once per event if it can be avoided. Uh, if there's an odd number of players forcing someone to receive a buy, that player will receive 75 match points for the round, but does not gain any SOS. Uh, concessions are discouraged. Should a player concede a round, their opponent immediately receives 100 match points, and the round victory, the player who conceded receives zero. All right, so that's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, then we get into the tournament rules. Um, there are some special rules in effect. Battlefield support. Each player has five battlefield support points to use every game with the following restrictions. Maximum of one selection per type of battlefield support. Strike, bombing, strafing, cover, artillery, minefield. Battlefield supports are chosen at the start of the event and noted on the force registry. So it's not something you can switch between each game. Um, optional special abilities are in effect. Alternate munitions, ECM and ECCM and multiple attack rolls. Uh, let's see. Then we have the events as far as like the lengths. Um, I want to say it's, yeah, two. Uh, um, two hours, including 90 minutes of game clock time and a downtime to allow players to finalize rules. So basically the rounds themselves are 90 minutes, um, but the 90 plus the 30 for the Figuring stuff out, setting up at the next table, all that comes out to about two hours. Uh, beginning of the round procedure, you review the scenario, exchange force registries. Each player rolls 2d6. Highest roll has initiative for the first turn. Lower roll chooses their board edge. Players place any objectives as directed. Players make any pregame decisions. Note them on the round scorecard. Um... BSP, alternate munitions, etc. So also that means that alternate munitions are allowed, which I didn't even account for when I made the theoretical list from hell for this. And then game begins. And you have like number of rounds and format. Uh, do, 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 do. Then what you do at the end of the round, handing your sheets, all that stuff, that's no big deal. There's sportsmanship, which of course is pretty common sense stuff. Um... Let's see here. Okay. All right. Units and unit cards. Because um, up till here, it's all like just. Um, I know the word I'm looking for. But. It's like your your admin type stuff. Like things have to happen before the before the tournament and games and so forth. Um, Battletech. BTCC Alpha Strike events use the master unit list as the source for the Alpha Strike unit cards. The cards produced by Catalyst Game Labs that are included in Force Packs are not used because Force registra Registries are required to be turned in with round scorecards at the end of every round. Unless otherwise noted, all of the units in the master unit list are legal for play, with the exception of the unit types listed below. If the unit type is on the list, it is forbidden by in BTCC play. If a unit has a redesigned model, that model is the one that should be used. So we have aerospace, support vehicles, industrial makes, advanced aerospace, any unit with the unique or Solaris 7 designation, offboard artillery, and units with the LAM or um, BIM special abilities. All right, so here's here's where we run into an issue. And okay, so in the next section, you have pre-drop inspection, and it has a thing called fresh off the line, um, and it refers to the models again. So when it says if a unit has a redesigned model, that model is the one that should be used. That means that um, people who have collections of iron wood metal miniatures that have had replacements 
you know, you have people who have been playing for years and years and years, and I understand they want to promote the way the game looks now, but you do have people who have like that well-painted Star League Defense Force or, um, heck, any of the, you know, the houses or some of the clan stuff. I mean, heck, not, not, not just some of the clan stuff. Um all of the clan stuff like you think about it all the original omnis have been replaced so if anybody is still playing with the force with the original omnis and they don't have the modern modern sculpts they're you know they, they shouldn't be using those um i don't know if that's gonna be a hard and fast hey you can't play or how that's gonna work so pretty much you do have scenario zero which is pre-drop pre -drop inspection uh it's bonus points above and beyond you may earn 50 points for having painted force to a more than tabletop standard uh three colors only is zero four colors up to cso level painting will be awarded 50 points Fresh off the line, if a player's force contains at least 50% of base models released since 2018, um, a game of armored combat and later, they'll be rewarded 50 points for that objective. So they're basically... Uh, I don't care for that simply because... Yeah, there's there's a lot of sculpts that are still really nice that are Ironwind metal. And you know, there are some, you know, some of the uh do you count the 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 new ones from Ironwind metals that are the same as the new plastics or just metal? I mean, I I would hope so, but they don't they don't tell us anything there. There's no specification. That's a 50 point bump if you did that as well. So, going into this, knowing how we can build a force, let's look at what I'm referring to as the force from hell. Um, this is a 400-point force using the building rules that are available for um, excuse me that are that are available for the uh, BTCC for Alpha Strike. And these are terrifying. Um, essentially, I've taken the best of the best as far as what can be done and turned it into something horrible. So, we have two lances of mechs and, a, and four, in, four battle armor units. Um, the... Mechs are split into two, you know, two lances. One of them is a medium battle lance. One of them is a light battle lance. The medium battle lance consists of three Hunchback Cs and a Timberwolf W. Um, so the requirements for a medium battle lance are as follows. Uh, at least 50% of the medium battle lance must be size 2, and there be no, may be no units of size 4 or larger in this formation. Uh, bonus ability is the standard battle lance ability. So you will be getting 6 or 5. Uh, yeah, 6. You'll be getting 6 points of lucky for your battle lance. Um, then we have the light battle lance, and the light battle lance requirements are almost identical, except 75% um, of the force must be size 1, and there may be no units of size 4 or higher. Um, at least one of the units in a light battle lance must be of the scout role, and bonus abilities is as per standard battle lance. So where that works is the 3 dasher H's. Um, 
they're not scouts, obviously, but then the Fireball ALM-10D is, and, you know, um, now as far as I can tell, I cannot do a Lance with the Infantry. I have three Kuchulian Support Armors, Squad Size 4, and one Marauder Battle Armor, Squad Size 4. Uh, so the three Kuchulians would ride on the Dashers, and the Marauder would ride on the Fireball, making everybody there the same speed. Where this gets interesting is that we can go, while binaries and companies are not a thing, combined transport and infantry formations. Um, now this is on page 121. And pretty much what it says, a formation may include mechs or vehicles that, in addition to their own combat role, serve as transport for integrated infantry. Uh, the clans call these formations Nova. Comps are on a word of Blake. Use level twos with infantry as integrated members. Inner sphere houses often have mechanized formations with transport vehicles and infantry working together. And some have even experienced with formations similar to clan Novas. Regardless of the universe name, um... given to the organization any faction may use either of the combined transport and infantry formation rules a mechanized or nova formation is built on top of an existing formation for the mechs or other non-infantry units the mechanized or nova formation fulfills the requirements and receives the bonuses for this formation using only its non-infantry members so it does sort of give the infantry a, a, an ability and Requirements, the non-infantry units in the mechanized or Nova formation must be capable of transporting all the infantry units in the formation simultaneously. This can be from battle armor using the mech special ability to mount units with Omni, battle armor with X-mech mounting mech units, any infantry mounting units with enough infantry transport or a combination of those. All right. Bonus ability. Choose either Mechanized or Nova. Now, we're not going to worry about Nova. Nova is an interesting ability and could be terrifying, but we're, we're just going to look at... Um, we're going to look at Mechanized. Mechanized transport units of the Mechanized formation may dismount the infantry units during movement. After dismounting, the transport may continue to use any remaining movement. All right. So... What that means is that the fireball and the dashers can essentially do a drive-by drop on objectives, um, which is scary um, because that's the the Kuchulian and the Marauder. All the battle armor have. Um, short and medium of three they don't have a lot of armor and structure but this seems like a bad thing oh and in addition to that also have skills lowered on the all the hunchbacks the mad cat and two of the dashers to three so they will hit like a truck um and they're re they have six rerolls for each of excuse me each of the lances. So those dashers have dashers and fireball have six rerolls. Now the fireball is probably never going to really use it. The dashers, on the other hand, with their five short, yeah. Same goes with the mad cat and the three hunchbacks. All four of them are going to use it. I mean everything here. Three hunchbacks and mad cat, they do six, 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 and seven respectively. The three fire moths do five at short. This is literally a hit and run list. So, you know, I mean, having used my experience, because I've I've won a couple major events. I won the TNT Alpha Strike event, um, which some people know of. Because I do know that, I believe it was Charles Gideon mentioned that, um, you know, part of what caused WolfNet to build their their format was me going in there with a, a very light list. 
and just tearing things apart. Uh, it, it was, I mean, and I can see like some of the remnants of the lessons learned there with the no skill zero people and limiting the number of low skill uh, units, which to me totally makes sense. What doesn't make sense though is two things. One of those being the, you can have up to three of the same mech chassis. And that all three can be the same variant. Because you know somebody's going to roll in there with like three of the, uh, oh, what's that thing called? Blood asps. Three of the blood asp, I think it's the T, where it does heat plus damage and it moves 10 inches um you know you just roll in with three of those and you just start shutting things down and killing them it's while i don't agree with wolfnet's format in how they how they actually execute the gameplay of the tournament i don't have any real problems with their format as far as what you do building up to that um the force building part i i like their force building system in fact when i designed well i shouldn't say i designed when i when i used their their thing as a basis for the uniform unicorn company um 350 format all I did was make it where you could take unique mechs, um, basically character mechs, and then if that if you know if you have a character mech, they have to be the commander in scenarios like head hunting and stuff like that, and of course also the fact that you play on a four x four with the full three fifty, which allows for Wolfnet forces to port right into that. And possibly allow some unicorn forces to port into Wolfnet as long as there's no unique mechs in it. But anyway, let's let, let let's look at the scenarios, shall we? So scenario one is a base assault. Now this this is a lot like the Wolfnet one where you have the the bunkers. Um, now objective, okay, so objective marker placement is, uh, each player places two objective markers, 10 inches off the center line in the clear terrain, in clear terrain on their half of the board, four inches from any board edge and eight inch from any other marker. Um, these markers are objective markers measuring two inches by two inches with a zero inch height. So they're using square markers, I believe, or the 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 ones that come in the Alpha Strike box. So they're they're basing a lot of this, it seems, off the Alpha Strike box. Um, objectives: destroy the base. The player must destroy all their opponent's markers. To destroy a marker, its CF must be reduced to zero. Each marker is a large heavy fortification with a CF of 30. Destruction of a marker is worth 30 points. All right. So list from hell. Round one. You, you're coming in off the table edge. We're going to assume a four by four. Um, because I don't think the thin long table is going to work with a full three, 350 points. It's they've they've tailored that format to work with 200 points so you add another 150 to it it's going to get very crowded very quickly so we're working with a four by four which means turn one you're halfway across the table with the with with the dashers and basically the light light battle lance and their infantry Hopefully you spread out and your opponent did not bring stuff to drop artillery on you um, as far as the battlefield support. 
if they make it through turn one, they head over on turn two. Um, they drop off the infantry. So you are standing next to a bunker with three mechs that do five damage. So that's 15 plus two from the um, fireball. So now you're at 17. And then you have four infantry doing three damage each. That's 12. So there's 29 damage on a bunker on turn two. And yeah, it's, you know, somebody just needs to plink it from medium range and, and boom, they're out of bunker. You load the infantry back up the next turn. You run over. You shoot it with the battle, the not the battle armor. You shoot it with the mechs. You then move again, disgorge all your infantry, finish off that bunker. Game's over. That's that is a three turn game, maybe four. Yeah, it's four turn game. So you're gonna get four to five turns. Um, the round ends after twelve rounds, or when one player reaches a hundred points. Or when somebody has no active units on the field. And if you kill your opponent, um, half the available objectives points are rewarded to the player with units still on the table. Should neither player have units remaining, the round is a draw and both players get none of the objective points. So, you don't want to table your opponent. Um, in this case, what you would probably do is leave like a battle armor unit alive and just not shoot it. Um, I've actually done this in scenarios before where I, it was a capture the flag type thing. I'm making my way back across the table and the battle master has it. Half of its movement is, its, its movement is reduced by half because it's carrying the objective. It got chased down and plinked constantly by a squad of elementals. It never stopped walking towards it. I, I didn't shoot them. I just literally, everybody just stood around and Battle Master slowly trudged off the table. Now, is that points farming? Yes. Totally points farming because if I killed my opponent, I would have been um, penalized for the position of the objective on the table and it not being at my home edge because I get the most points for it making my home edge. At the same time, though, it's sort of necessary to to play that scenario that way when, when I played it. Um, it's a scenario that Fortress has used for two years at the Southern Assault Tournament. I really do not like... No, Nobody likes that scenario. Because you usually just end up with a giant pile of mechs in the middle of the table, beating the living hell out of each other, hoping to get the objective. It becomes basically king of the hill. Next up, we have scenario two, stand-up fight. Uh, do, do, do. This one is a killing scenario. It, it's literally who can kill more of the enemy. Um, so a player earns match points equal to the total of destroyed units PV divided by four rounding to the nearest whole number between one and a hundred. Um, the game ends on phase, uh, the end phase of turn 12. As soon as one player has no active units on the board or time is ended. If both players still have active units, you just tally it up and see who, you know, who wins. You're not doing partial damage for force withdrawal rules. It's just what's destroyed. Um, that scenario would be the hardest for the list from hell, but it would probably stand a chance simply because you would gang up on your opponent. Um, you, you just pick something and delete it from the table every turn. Like, yeah, the fast movers are going to be harder to get rid of, but the slower units, 
heavies assaults you, you just you just pick them and delete them um and i know I'm, I'm looking at this in the theoretical and you're going to take return fire and everything else you're going to lose units but you should be able to out You should be able to outkill your opponent. The only time I see this being an issue is if they bring a purely attrition list. Like it is all the armor boxes, all the structure boxes, case two, any. It is built to survive this scenario. But if it's built to survive this one scenario, it's not going to win any other scenarios. It's not going to have the mobility or the firepower. Next we have escort. Um, escort, you place a vehicle marker in the center of the table. The vehicle uh, objective marker is either uh, either is or has a standard hex face. Um, players enter from their home edge, and it looks like you enter from your home edge in all these, which I think is a nice... Uh, okay, so on scenario two, you deploy three inch, up to three inches from the edge. Um, scenario three, you enter from your home edge. Basically, the point of this, you are trying to gain control of the vehicle by um, having more units within six inches of the base of the marker, which, mind you, if you are running this list, you are going to run your four light mechs up to within six inches, and then drop off all the infantry. Now you have eight units next to the vehicle. Um, but, so you have to have, okay. During the end phase, having more units within six inches of the base of the marker. In the following turn, the controlling player may move the vehicle objective marker as prescribed in the special rules section below. If both players have the same number of units within six inches, um, control is not given to either player. If neither player has control of the marker, it cannot move during the movement phase. Each game turn that a player gains control of the marker, they earn 20 match points at the end of the turn. If the marker moves off the table edge, the game is immediately over, and the controlling player earns maximum match points for the objective. Um, so the, which I think maximum is 100, it looks like. Um, it's a 0 to 100 scale. The vehicle objective marker moves six inches. It's considered a wheeled vehicle. It will move along the shortest available route towards the controlling player's home edge. Um, it cannot be attacked or destroyed, and the controlling player moves it as if it's one of their units taking up a slot in initiative order. Uh, it's not capable of using sprinting. And the game ends after turn 12 or when one player reaches 100 points as soon as one player has no active units on the board or the round time has ex expired and like i said pretty much you dump eight units on this thing turn one you then go and walk it back you move the vehicle six inches you move your bubble of mechs six inches and well your battle armor they're they're screwed but by turn two three you should have your um I mean, the, the battle armor will act as a very annoying speed bump because that is 12 damage they can throw at something within medium range. So your opponent is going to have to deal with that. But, yeah, you literally walk it back with the light mechs because they're going to get their four. Um, and then on top of that, you get your your mediums and your heavy up to it. And everything here, like I said, is moving a minimum of 10 you're going to be on that thing turn two to escort it back to your home edge. You've won the game. Um, I, I, the only way I see this being an issue is if you have a mirror match where somebody else can dump as many units on it on the same turn. I don't think that's going to happen. Then we have scenario four. Uh, this one is a little bit harder and a little bit not harder. So this is Headhunter. Um, 
Each player assigns three non-infantry units to act as their force commanders, with one primary commander and two secondary. Players do not reveal these units to one another and may mark three special units with a token or with pencil marker on their unit cards. Players then deploy their units in their respective deployment zones. Which... It doesn't tell us what the size of the deployment zone is. Okay, so that's an oversight the Catalyst probably wants to fix. Um, I'm assuming it's three inches, simply based off the other one that has a deployment zone. Um, objective, cut off the head, and if, a, if an opponent destroys a primary commander, they're awarded 50. If an opponent destroys a secondary, they get 25. Uh, once all three commanders are removed from play, from a, a player's force, the game ends. So you are just head hunting three mechs. Uh, the following rules are in effect for the scenario. Unlike other rounds in this mission, players are not allowed to look at their opponent's cards until that, until that unit has been scanned. Uh, revealing information. Using probes, PRB, BH, RCN, special abilities, player may instead hide who the commanders are for, and force the opponent to scan them directly by declaring a target within their range. Um... ECM disrupts scanning. So this list would suffer here because I don't think there's any ECM in it or probe or light probe. Um, well, actually, no, I take that back. Light probe, probe, bloodhound. Okay, so an RCN. Let me look at it real quick. Oh, I haven't opened it. I mean, I have the thing up from... There we go. All right, so... What a case. Case. Oh, those are stealth. Ooh, that's interesting. E&E. -E. Uh, nope. Okay, so, yeah. So, no, you're, you're not going to have... You're not going to have anything that can cut through, so this is literally, you have to keep your three from dying. So this this list will suffer a little bit here, but if you're efficient about it, you can just start killing things. And, and depending on how big their force is, it shouldn't take you long to kill the commander. Um, meanwhile, they have eight mechs, they have to figure out which one's the commander. Uh, to, 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 if both players have the same amount of VP when time's called, players must compil, uh, compare kill scoring with whomever has destroyed the most amount of PV being declared the victor. If this value is also a tie, the game is a draw. Uh, the game ends after the end phase, round 12, 100 points, or no active units. Or the round time ends. So... The prototype list from Hell, which does not contain any of the electronic warfare stuff, would probably do very well in this format. Especially in smaller events where you might have um, not enough people. So like an eight-person tournament like at a, at a game store. This type of list is going to dominate. At a larger event, it'll have a little bit of trouble, but I have a feeling that something that this or something very much like it would essentially just run over whatever you put in front of it. Um, quite literally, in this case, for the most part, you the the three dashers running around like a wolf pack, for example, are going to be able to run up to something and gun it down. And then one thing that I didn't think of in that scenario where you have the, you know, probe and everything, if your opponent has like one or two units with those abilities, you basically go kill those. You, you, you just gun them down immediately. Um, odds are they're not their commanders, but without those abilities, you are now on, on even, uh, even playing field. With the three dashers and, you know, like I said, you're dropping 17 points of damage a turn, another 12, 29 damage total if you have, you know, if you're dropping the battle armor with them. 
which suddenly makes it where, you know, um, and looking at these scenarios, I'm not going to lie. The battle armor is almost superfluous. I could probably replace those with a vehicle, um, a vehicle lance. Um, I'd have to see what's available to me, but yeah, it, it's, you know, it, they're soup, they're, they're superfluous in the fact that they are not, they don't do anything. Um, I know, that sounds horrible. But I could swap them out with something more mission specific, like three Gabriel Reconnaissance Hovercraft, which, wow, those don't have, well, that, that's, that's kind of pointless. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could go through and find like a very fast light vehicle that, you know, is going to be able to scan things for me. And yeah, so that is pretty much it for this. Um, as far as, you know, as far as covering the, uh, the BTCC Alpha Strike rules, I do want to say on a side note, um, that mercenaries in the old clan era are broken. Um, I played them at, uh, Southern Assault last year. I plan on using them again this year. Spoilers. Um, they're broken. They're, they're just way, way, way better than they should be. Uh, and it's because they have like a supermarket of equipment to choose from. You have almost all of the original clan Omnis and, uh, and their current variants. You know, it's not like they, it's not like they don't have access to the newest high-end equipment that's on a Mad Cat or a Dasher or anything like that. Although the Dasher H is actually kind of old at this point. Um, I feel like mercenaries, while yes, I use them and I use them for the specific advantage of that they can just take whatever they want and just lollygag around the field and do, you know, like they can, they can have a unit that is going to be like super fast, hard hitting. They can have a unit that's literally all armor and medium to high damage output. You name it, they can do it. And the reason they can do it is because, you know, that they're, they're they can, they have access to everything or almost everything. I mean, there's a few mechs I wish they did and they don't, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, so that's everything for today's episode. I'm not going to be doing a mech tech. This episode's a little bit off in the weeds as far as, you know, everything about it for the most part. Um, I've had some stuff going on in my life, and it's been kind of crazy. I was in a car accident a few days ago, um, so my Jeep got totaled, and now I have a massive, massive Chrysler Pacifica that's like almost 20 years old, but has no mileage on it. Um, just also crazy in and of itself, but I'm, I'm going down a weird route right now with, with the conversation here and my AC just kicked in, which is like the little thing that says at the Oscars, it's time for you to go. So I want to thank you very much for listening to today's episode. If you like what we're doing, you want to help support the podcast, um, please go to patreon.com slash unicorn company. There you will find a variety of tiers. Uh, you get everything from 3D printed miniatures to weird little insights into the show. Um, I put out custom Alpha Strike cards for mechs as often as I can. Um, commission work helps with that because I get to take pictures of a whole lot of different mechs, which means I can have a lot of these different mechs in different paint schemes. And I'm looking at even offering... Um, to my patrons the ability to have me do custom mech cards with their mechs on them um so that's something that might be coming up in the future anyhow um this is carrie signing off i hope that all of you have a great day great evening great whatever it is where you are and i'll talk to you next time i want to play the game you want to sink swim